Rakata isekete makosoko tolobo mende kosaya ya mikundulu bushenda ya kusaka makashika kulubu haya hey loose the source today abusha kasekete lodo bushai hallelujah with clarity the word of God will go forward shandi akasaya God will be praised. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Come in the name of the living God. Labondo bo shatai. Ile me kesata. Aya shikuri aba. Hie sete. Anamasutu robo shaya. Ila kasete. The swords will be loose today. In Jesus mighty name. O shata kasai. You know, let us just unmute and worship God. Ah, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you are about to do. Lord, don't shake him. Hallelujah. Jesus. I'm going to ask you to continue to worship the Lord in your atmospheres. Glory be to God. When I first spoke to missionary Mitchell about doing this, the two scriptures that I told her that I, I agreed to come from was Obadiah and Daniel. But as I was reading them, I couldn't feel a connection. And the spirit of the Lord led me to Romans 1 from verse 16 to 32. And so that will be the scripture that I will be delivering from today. It here beginneth a portion of God's holy words. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written. The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who owe the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shown, showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image make, made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, 
Coviciousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, de debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Here endeth a portion of God's holy words. And we will say thanks be to God. You know, as we were praying, I saw that Sister TJ is here. I want to greet you, Sister TJ. I saw Sister Ma Malia. I want to greet you, Sister Malia. The Lord bless you. And I want to say happy birthday, missionary Mitchell. <clears throat> now, as I was thinking about doing this presentation, is really asking the Lord to give me, you know, direction as to where to go and what to do. And after he gave me the scripture, then I found that he had me looking at what the spirit of pride is, what the spirit of pride is. And after I found that, I was asking him, God, what should be the topic for today? I didn't immediately hear something, you know, after a while it came to me and then I was saying, Lord, if this is not you, then let it be changed. But I recognize that he allowed it to stay. And so the topic that we're going to be speaking on today is the spirit of pride must die. It must die. It must be eliminated out of our lives. It is such a wicked and a diabolical spirit. You know, when you talk about pride, you see somebody that is lofty looking and arty. You know, pride actually has a look. It actually has a demeanor. It actually has a personality and it shows itself. But it goes way much deeper than that. And so today we are going to be looking at that spirit of pride. And I want to take my time in presenting today. Because as I was doing this, I heard the Lord saying, go easy with it. It needs to reach the hearts and the souls of man today. So we want to look at what is pride. According to the dictionary online, pride is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely you know, admired. So if you're if you're talking about pride, you can be proud for what you have accomplished, you know, what you have. But it can also be that you're proud because of who you're associated with. Notice the, the words that describes pride. Pride has an association. It's not just happy for any and anyone. Now, according to the Baker's Evangelical Dictionary, and that was the only biblical dictionary that you could find a theological definition for pride in. When I went into the Easterns, pride was eliminated. When I went into the Hitchcock, pride was eliminated. When I went into the Holmans, pride was eliminated and some other ones. Why is that? Because politically pride is associated with a group. It is associated with the LGBTQIA plus two. And so because they do not want to offend and they do not want to be canceled into today's society, they have eliminated the word from the biblical dictionary. But I thank God for the Baker's Evangelical Dictionary. Now it describes pride as a disposition or attitude and a type of conduct. It includes the ideas of arrogance, cynical insensitivity to the needs of others and presumption. So it is a presumptuous spirit. It's an arrogant spirit. It's a cynical spirit. It's callous to the feelings of other people. Pride often is often linked with parts of the body. Isaiah 2 and 11 says, people with a big head are headed for a fall. 
pretentious egos are brought down a peg. It's God alone at front and center on the day we're talking about. Isaiah 2 and 17 says the swelled big heads will be punctured bladders. Lord God Almighty, in other words, you're going to wet yourself. You're going to be the shame of yourself. The pretentious egos brought down to earth, leaving God alone at front and center on the day we're talking about. Pride is associated with the eyes. It's associated with the spirit. It's associated with the heart. It's associated with the mouth. Psalms 101 verse 5 says, Who so privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an eye look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. My God, for it is the spirit of a man that drives the person of a man. It influences your behavior. Isaiah 9, 9 says, that say in the pride and stoutness of the heart. Proverbs 14 and verse 3 says, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Remember, pride is associated with body parts. It is the eyes. It is the spirit, it is the heart, it is the mouth. Understand that your eyes, your heart, your mouth, those are portal to your spirit, man. For whatever gets old or gets into you from your eyes and your mouth, it influences your heart and your heart influences your spirit. Your spirit then sends a message to your soul. We're going to be looking at the, the, the spirit that is associated with pride. For there are two that we will examine today. You know, there are a few spirits associated with pride, but we can only look at the two. Time won't allow us to look at all. In Greek mythology, they have defied, defied excess. So they have made excess a god. And they call it hubris or ibris, referring to excessive attitudes just the very phrase alone lets you know that god cannot be in that and these excessive attitudes are the likes of passion and pride outrage crime and transgression i will repeat that again these excessive attitudes are passion pride outrage crime and transgression in short the term is opposed to temperance and reason, which is known as logos. Now, when we think about logos, remember that the Lord God Almighty is the logos. He is the word. The Lord God Almighty is temperate. So if this spirit is opposed to it, it means it is opposed to God's word and it is opposed to the nature of God. So we're looking at a spirit that is anti-Christ in its operation understand that the lord has spoken specifically to us about being moderate god has called us to moderation in philippians 4 5 to 7 he says let your moderation be known unto all men the lord is at hand be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, it comes back to the heart. It comes back to the mind, which is the spirit or the will of a man. Romans 1, 20 to 22. And we're going to look at that and deal with it. It says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. When the ones who were converted, because this is what the scripture is talking about. It's not talking to the, the unsafe. It's talking to those who know God, know of God, and are the call converted and saved. When those ones, the ones who should have known God, the ones who were converted, the ones who should have been saved, had taken a look at the things that God had created, that speaks of his majesty and the vastness of his of the expanse that he alone holds up, which was created by his word, his logos, through his eternal power and Godhead, they did not reverence him as God. Therefore, people of the living God, we are without excuse because the visible things of God speaks to the invisible things of him. Therefore, it is a legal witness against the pride of man's heart and vain imaginations. The very things that's created that we can look at in the firmament, the very things that we can look at on the earth, the very things we can look at in the sea. These are a legal witness before heaven and earth against the pride of man's heart and vain imaginations that have caused them to become unthankful and not, not able to glorify God as God. The God that is holy, the God that is righteous, the God that is divine. And if that was not enough, pride causes an individual to profess to be wise, even though they have become foolish as their actions declares that there is no God. So you're inexcusable, even though pride presents excuses. Pride looks for a way to operate. Yet the created things of God makes it inexcusable. Romans 1, 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. There is an outrage where pride is concerned and the spirit, hubris or ibris. Because when it comes in, and mark you, it is a feminine spirit. When it comes in, it causes the individual to change the uncorruptible glory of God into an image made like to corruptible man. So you make man your God, you make birds your God, you make four-footed beasts your God, you make creeping things your God. There are many children who used to come to Sunday school who heard the message of salvation, but now they have made idols. Their images posted all over their homes. They have now declared that they no longer believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their religion is another thing. I have heard persons saying that the woman is a God. I've heard persons saying that they are a God. I've heard persons saying that aliens and, and science is a God. Lord Jesus, there are those that worship stars, moons. There are those that worship mermaids, even though it is not a real thing but a spirit. Not only has pride caused man to change the image of God, but the image and likeness of themselves. Because if you're willing to change God's image, then you're going to change your own image. So this pride makes man no longer contented with their own image and likeness. Lord God. That is why you can find a man saying he feels like a woman and he is changing his gender. A woman saying she's feeling like a man and changing her gender. It's a trans bite, Lord God. So without transformation, you have become a transvestite. Without transformation, you have now become a queer, an homosexual, a lesbian, a gay, a bisexual, a, a, a asexual, whatever they want to call themselves, because they have changed the image of the in uncorruptible God into corruptible beings. 
So what should stop them from changing their own image? No longer contented with how they look. There are those that are doing butt surgeries and dying. Lip implants, breast implants. You didn't have cancer, you didn't cut off any breast. But you're not satisfied with the shape. You want something else. So you're doing the adage because you are the one that created yourself. Yet the word of the Lord said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Pride does these things. You want to fit in with the trend. So instead of desiring to be who God has made you in gender and having that transformed mind, you seem to seek to emulate and be like the world. That's what pride does when it comes into the individual. It begins to mess with their esteem. And they can never be satisfied because the spirit is not satisfied. You are no longer a new creature with old things passing away, but you want the profane to mingle with the new wine. And so you find those that were converted, that were changed, they're, they're seeking to look like the world, sound like the world, act like the world, dress like the world, be a part of the world. And this is where we see the spirit of Baphomet now coming and possessing those who ought to be blood washed and cleansed. Because the spirit of pride, it elevates. So it moves from that feminine spirit of hubris and iris that's, uh, that's flamboyant and does things in an excessive manner. And it brings along with it confusion that is genderless. Oh, she make a sigh. It becomes an outrage. So the things that were subtly changing until it got to an excessive level has now become total and utter confusion the lord said new wine needs a new butter and so that is why he has cleansed us with his blood and purified us before giving us the holy ghost but not only are we using old butter, we are putting new wine in the whole butter and it is causing a combustion. There are explosions happening within the body of Christ. And that is because pride has gotten into the midst of us. The Lord said to his body to come out and be separate, touch not the unclean thing. But we have caused dead flies to get into the apothecary, which is the sacred oil. And a stinking smell is filling the nostrils of God. And it is from the body of Christ who have become excessive and overindulgent, operating in the spirit of confusion, confusion, baphomet. Don't we know, don't you know that it is lost? that conceives sin. And when it is finished, it destroys. So the Lord says, touch not, taste not, and not, that you perish not with the using. There are some things that we ought not to touch. There are some things that we ought not to taste. There are some things that we not, ought not to handle. Don't worry yourself about if you're able to handle it. Just don't touch it at all. But not only are we doing that, we are running after man's ordinances because that's what the spirit of pride does. And it is causing us to become brazen, presumptuous, impudent, stiff-necked, and using God's grace as an occasion to sin. The message is to depart from the iniquity of corrupting God's image and your own through repentance. Only repentance can deliver us from this outrage and inexcusable behavior. So let us depart from it, people of the living God. Ah, shut up. We cannot use God's grace that abounds as an occasion to sin. God forbid, Paul says.
Let us not only depart from that and repent, but let us get rid of confusion, that baphomet spirit. Romans 1.24 says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves because they refused to repent. See, this baphomet spirit, it's not only a spirit of confusion, but it brings along sickness. It brings about madness. It brings about lewd behavior. It is a lover of attention and praise. It is genderless. It is effeminate. It is a lying spirit. It is a deceiving spirit that holds persons bound. So when you don't repent immediately, you are now finding yourself sinking into a mire. Especially if you have children, understand that this spirit just does not come for you because what it really wants is children. You see the seed, the new converts, just notice within our churches, it's like a revolving door. Persons are getting saved, but as soon as they get saved, they're leaving. That's that Baphomet spirit. So it's not just children in, in terms of age, but children in terms of maturity. Because pride has taken up the body of Christ. And it's an ugly look. Hey, shatter. It operates through anyone. And it brings the happenings of the world into the body of Christ. Ezekiel 18 and 2 says, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So what we, what the elders were doing, it, it's causing the next generation to have the repercussion. You want to talk about the bondage of a, a, a set of young people now that cannot identify with Christ. That's because their parents complained about the church, complained about salvation. And so they're turned off. They have never even come to church, but they don't want to hear about it. Too much bad things. Some of them may even be from households where their parents are still going, but pride has lifted up in their parents and they talk all manner of things, lewd behavior and bad examples before them. So they can't come. And what this does is to lead to an unnatural passion, a passion that is excessive and uncontrollable. Therefore, our bodies that ought to be temples of God is being exposed to all uncleanness. And we are dishonoring our bodies between ourselves and telling God that he is expelled from our beings. That's what we are saying when we are giving over ourselves to effeminacy, to lying, to deceit. And being driven by our loss. Because we are now desecrating the temple. We mar the very setup of God. This is the confusion the spirit comes to bring. Uncontrollable behavior. No order. Because where the order of God is the presence of God is there. And God is not the author of confusion. So when you see this chaotic spirit, you know that the enemy, the devil is behind it. One of the things that it brings is called viciousness. The word says in Matthew 5 and verse 8, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Yet excuses are being made for those that are lifted up in pride through teachings and preachings by false prophets and teachers to accommodate their, the eyes of a man that is never satisfied according to the word of the Lord. This is what Job said in chapter 31 and verse 1. I have made an agreement with my eyes not to look with desire at a young woman. And that is according to the New Living Translation. I have made an agreement with my eyes not to look with desire at a young woman. 
And when he made that agreement with his eyes, it was giving it over as covenant unto God. It is an act of covetousness that causes you to look. So stop coveting another man or woman's spouse. Keep your eyes and affection on your own. Build on what the Lord has given you. Stop being driven by lust for what God has put together. Let no man put asunder. And covetousness, it doesn't just stop with the passion of the flesh, but it also involves the eyes because some of us want what our neighbor has. The dress our sister is wearing, the shoe the brother is wearing, the house that this one has, the job that that one has, the children that this one has. Stop it. It's a spirit of pride. Stop comparing and start working what the Lord has given you. It is these things that causes fightings and wars amongst the body of Christ. The Lord has given you a particular anointing, but you want to operate in somebody else's anointing. The Lord called you to be a part of the body, but covetousness is causing you to tell yourself that you're something else. That's confusion. Because if you're the eye, what, is, what are you doing in the mouth? And if you're the teeth, what are you doing on the head? Get rid of covetousness. It is a spirit of pride. Vile affections is a result of pride. Romans 1, 26 to 27 says, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. There are some that are driven by vile affections because it's a manifestation of the spirit of pride. When you see a woman changing the natural use of that which is against nature and man leaving the natural use of a woman, why? Because they are burned in their lust towards each other, working in themselves that which is unseemly and receiving the recompense of their error, not God's error. You know, as I was going over the scripture and I was just talking to the Lord and I was saying to the Lord, you know, some may say, what about an Hermaphrodite? And the Lord reminded me that when he made man, he made man perfect. And in chapter five of Genesis, when he made those that he called the sons of Adam and they had the DNA of Adam, they were perfect. But when men sin, when man sinned, his DNA became corrupted. And so our, our methodite is a result of a corrupted DNA when pride gets in. Because remember the serpent told Eve that you will be like God's violent. Fictions causes or DNA structure to change. And it's not just a physical thing, but a spiritual one. Because understand the physical thing changed. But when Adam heard God's voice, his spiritual thing was changed too. And he started to complain and had a problem with Eve. And he started to say, the woman that you have given me. Accusation against God and the woman. Who he had originally had none against. So it's their error that they are receiving, not God's error. Yishata. Abba Sataya. This world wants us to be in sympathy of the devil and in sympathy of, of vile affections, in sympathy of confusion and a baphomet spirit and a prideful spirit, taking the rainbow, the promise, the seal of God's throne and stamping it on a profane thing that is corruptible. The Lord God Almighty rebuke that act today. We will not be that people. When was it a natural thing to feel like a man as a woman? Or a woman as a man? 
when did it become a natural thing? Much less to be in sexual contact with each other. Why is it okay for men to be in pants so tight that nothing is left to the imagination but women are to be modest? Isn't that a double standard? Because modesty is for all. Male and female made eat them. The devil is preying some people's aine. Because modesty is for all for you to cover up your rumps, your aines, and your business. And I'm using these phrases because I don't want to get too graphic. So while the Lord God Almighty has given you modesty to cover up so you can have some dignity and pride and remain in the calling that he has given unto you to cover that which the enemy wants to expose. You are exposing yourself and the devil he is freeing you. And while you are there all proud because you are trending, he has an assault waiting for you. Because there's somebody in the midst that is struggling. And if you give the enemy occasion, he will rape you. And I'm talking about a spiritual rape and a physical rape. A deceit so grand that if you do not repent of the stoutness of the art, that is influencing your behaviors and emotions and return to the natural use, come out from vile affections, you will be plunged so deep that you won't even remember your name. When loss is conceived, it brings forth death. Another aspect of the spirit of pride is it leads to transgression. Listen to what Romans 1.28 says. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not, which are not convenient. There is nothing. That's saying, don't go there anymore. You see, the transgression of not retaining God in our knowledge has resulted in God giving us over to our reprobate mind when pride fills the heart. Because pride has scales so thick that nothing can go between them. So literally, no matter what the word they're hearing, it's like it's knocking on an empty wood. So that we do what is not convenient and it doesn't even seem wrong. My God. You know, brothers and sisters, we have Israel to our example. When their knowledge of God was corrupted, they saw, but they were blind. They heard, but they were deaf. They were walking dead. That is why we can see in churches today a spirit of homosexuality, a spirit of seduction, a spirit of lie, a spirit of deceit ministering from our rostrums. And they're ministering some emotional words. It drives everybody and, you know, there is this uh, movement in the spirit. But no souls is being saved. No one is being changed. No one is being delivered. The captives are still bound. The sick is still sick and healing. Because pride and its transgression. And even when others can see, they just can't see. 
See, judgment was upon Israel for more than 400 years at the end of a wicked man who as their king was a prideful man, Nebuchadnezzar. He was so prideful that he set up an image that was a monstrosity of himself. And even when God gave him a vision, he forgot quickly about the vision and came talking about the kingdom that he set up for himself. And the Lord made a public example of him by making him mad, naked with claws like a hawk, eating and sleeping like a lion or a wild beast. Understand that pride, the Lord says, comes before a fall. The Lord will expose the prideful one. He will strip you of the clothing and the cloak and the covering he has presented upon you if you will not turn. It is important to retain God in our knowledge and it is important to repent of transgressions. Don't be prideful when the word is delivered and you know it's you it's talking about. God warns the city before he destroys the city. But pride, pride will have you remembering the very act that you did and sitting there hoping that no one sees you. Because who, me? Me evangelist so-and-so or pastor so-and-so or teacher so-and-so or apostle so-and-so or prophet so-and-so. I can't go to the altar. How can I let people know that I am sick? How can I let people know that I need help? Pride. And it leads to transgression. And sometimes it's not even such a, a, a big thing as we love to put big sins here and little sins there. Sometimes it's a little leaven that leaveneth the whole lump. The small things the Lord is talking to us about. And he has sent messages for one clean up us because of pride. Pride and transgression takes you out of the service of God. But the fear of God is service unto God. When you fear God and you repent, it is you coming to service unto God. Proverbs 1, 7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That is why retaining a God knowledge is important. And the spirit of pride, the devil himself knows this. It is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, according to Proverbs 9 and verse 10. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 10, 27 says, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, it is wrapped up in the fear of the Lord, and it's a reward to those that give heed to it. It carries a length of days. To fear God is to serve him. It's not just you saying, I fear God. But you keep his commands, not the suppositions that you have, not the interpretations that you give to his word, but literally taking what he has said and obeying it. This is what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. Notice the questions he directed to Peter. Lovest thou me more than these? Because he had called Peter out of fishing. But Peter went back into fishing because of the pride of his heart. When he fell, he couldn't say to his brethren, I had denied the Lord. And I feel like I don't belong to the body of Christ anymore. Instead, he found himself isolated. And only a few did he communicate with. The Lord had to personally invite him all over again because of the love that God has for him. 
So God says, lovest thou me more than these? He said, yeah, Lord. God said, okay, feed my sheep. Peter, you were the one that had so much questions. You were the one that I gave so much information. You were the one that I took into secrecy with me. You were the one that saw things that others did not see. How can you let these things called pride separate you? I already knew you would deny me. Come. He asked him a second time. Peter said, yeah, Lord. Feed my lamb. He asked him a third time. He got mad. But God was doing that because he was giving him a mandate. So if you love me more than these, do these things. Feed the sheep. Feed the lamb. And when you are converted, convert others. Because when you love me, you Keep my commandments. It's more than saying, I fear God. It's an act. It's a service. It's a doing. And that's why the spirit of pride comes to stop. Because if you have the knowledge of God, then you will serve him. How can you serve God if you don't know him? You won't read the word. You won't pray. You won't fancy. That is why pride is continually lifted up. John 14, 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Understand that when the spirit of pride comes, this is what it's blocking. The love of God and the manifestation of God in the life of the believer. Mashandaya. The enemy has always been jealous because he was a cast down foe. So he wants to stop us Mashande, from coming into that covenant relationship with God. He wants to stop us from having God's manifestation because God created us in his image and likeness. God gave us dominion and authority over the created things except for man on earth. He had nothing. He had to stand back when God was speaking everything into being. And when man was placed in the garden, he had to keep his bounds because Adam had authority and Adam was walking between the natural and the supernatural. Adam had the power to go from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. Hey, shakatai. Adam was a red man, but he was also a fire being. And that made the enemy mad. Because he was just a flaming spirit that after he was cast down, didn't have no form anymore. He has to illegally assume somebody else's body to operate. But man was given a form. And look at the spirit of pride wants to change that which the Lord has done, creating man after his image and likeness. A man wants to look like the woman that comes out of his side. Jesus, the blood of Jesus. The spirit of pride is a lying spirit. If you eat of this fruit, you shall be as gods. They were already like God. They were in the image and likeness of God. Believer, you are made above and not beneath. We are seated together with Christ in heavenly places, but we are allowing the world to bring us down to sit in corruptible places, chasing after looking like these people and following after trends. The blood of Jesus is against the spirit of pride. We plunder it today. Shandaya. Elokosa. It doesn't just come to steal that knowledge that brings into the fear and service and manifestation and relationship of God. But pride is a crime. It makes you a criminal. Listen to the criminal acts that the same spirit of pride goes into heavenly courts 
to accuse us with. Romans 1, 29 to 31. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, viciousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, biters, haters of God, because you're not fearing him, so you hate him, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable and merciful. My God. It causes an individual to become wicked against their brothers and their sisters. You see it in Cain. Instead of repenting of the offering that he brought to the Lord, he hated his brother. He murmured against his brother. He murdered his brother. And then he had the audacity to ask God, am I my brother's keeper? We cannot esteem them above ourselves. He didn't want God to say that Abel has done well. Mashata. He wanted the glory for himself that Baphomet shake it. Eh? There is always a cause to be at war and tear into their character. There is always a war to envy and rip what they have from them in hostility. The Bible says that Cain sought argument with Abel in the field. And that's where he slew him. Wicked diabolical spirit. Shendebiai. Hey God, it makes you criminal. It drives your blood pressure. It rouses you. It fills you with wrath. It is rape. It is debate. Remember Tamar and her brother. Instead of asking for her hand, he raped her and claimed he loved her. And afterward, he hated her. Spirit of pride. It is debate. It is gossiping. It is deceitful and a lie. This spirit of pride cannot tell truth because God is the spirit of truth. And outside of him is lies. The word says, let all man be a liar and God be true. The spirit of pride is a backbiter. You wonder why people bite into the back of another. And when they see their sisters and their brothers, they are he, 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 he. My God. What a vampire. That's the spirit manifesting. It is despiteful. It is a booster. It invents evil things to destroy its brothers and sisters. It is disobedient. It's not only disobedient to parents, but to leadership. It doesn't value anyone. It has no understanding. All it understands it is, is itself and its own needs. It is a covenant breaker. It drives you to break covenant with God and man. Pride causes a man to leave his wife because the foolish spirit is telling him you're married wrong. Or the foolish spirit is telling him the woman had three kids and so she lost her shape. She not, she not comely no more. But did you know that you could take her to the gym and work along with her? Or the spirit of pride is saying to the wife, you are educated, you are above him now. You don't have to listen to him. When God has made the man the head of the household, the priest of his family. It is a covenant break amongst friends. For no good reason. Covenant break. But today, God wants to call us to renew our covenant with him. But see, when you enter into a covenant with God, you're required to make a cut in your heart and mind so that the laws of God will be written within. That's what Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 speaks about. 
and you can be separate from the lifestyle that led you into the paths of death because God calls you to cut off that lifestyle. If pride causes a person to break covenant, it is a divorcement from God with a public declaration that you are no longer a witness to the power of his blood. So when you break covenant, understand that that's what you're doing. Publicly, you're signing a bill of divorcement for everyone to see that I no longer stand as a witness um, for God to the fact that the power of his blood is able to change my life. And so what you do is to crucify my fresh. But pride doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just want you to divorce God. It doesn't come to just steal. It comes to kill. So it seeks to take others so it breaks truths with the hope that they too will break covenant. You know why? It creates friction. Friction amongst you and your brethren. And so when that friction takes place, it hopes that you will not endure and, and serve God being faithful and obedient. It wants you to have a design, which is a diagnosis called church hurt, so you will break covenant with God. So instead of stop going to that church, you find yourself not going to church at all. That's what that spirit comes to do. So it breaks the covenant with the individual and God. And then it becomes truth breakers with others. And it says all kind of vile, hurtful things in the attempt to create friction so that they will have church earth and break their covenant with God. It comes to steal and to kill and ultimately to destroy. So we need to get rid of the emotions when we're saying, God, we repent but not turning and come into true repentance. Because this thing is a diabolical thing that sets out to kill, to steal, and to destroy. It is so self-centered that it has no mercy, no compassion, no true affection, no love. The spirit of pride in a person is the opposite of temperance and reason, which is what we call understanding. Remember, it is God who is love and he is long suffering towards us. That is why those things are a part of the fruit of the spirit. You see, when you step outside of God, all you get is use, misuse and abuse. Pride takes you out of the presence of God. Therefore, your prayers can't be answered because he does not give ear to the proud. And that is what the spirit of pride comes to do. Destroy any form of relationship. It causes you then, when you're praying and you're not hearing anything, to be filled with emotions, just crying, but no true repentance. Remember Esau? After he broke his covenant and sold his birthright, he sought his father when the, the birthright was given to Jacob with much emotions. He was crying, but he could not find a place of repentance. And he did not get back that birthright. The blessing was already released. And so he hated his brother unto death. That's what will happen if we come to God with emotions rather than repentance in a spirit of pride. It was so much so that venom spewed from Esau to the preceding generation. Obadiah 1 speaks of the pride of the heart of the Edomites, who are the sons and daughters of Esau. It was so bad that they rejoiced to see the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem, who are the children of Jacob, their own flesh and blood. The Bible says they stood by while the enemy plundered and they even were accessory to the fact. Do you know that that's how the enemy is working within the body of Christ? When the spirit of pride comes on a person, you see the enemy ripping into your brother and your sister and hear what you say. 
Oh, me did know a long time. They name mean God. Mm -mm. The one that made it sit that long time. And you rejoice to see the soul die. You rejoice to see the soul no longer in the church. Listen, they were criminals before God. Because pride will let you see your brother and sister fall or overtaken in a fault. And you will rejoice celebrating the enemy that's spoiling the kingdom. Whose side are you on? Lord God. So while you have on the name of Jesus in the kingdom, the spirit of pride is risen up in you and you are now enemy to the kingdom. This puts you at tree sun to the state of God's kingdom, which means that you are an enemy within. Yet the prideful heart cannot see that. And desires for everyone to be at their side, even though they are not at anyone's side. Only those that they are associated with, and God forbid if those fall, they do the same thing. I'm telling you, these entities, when they come and when they take over a person, these are the operations. So when you see your brother and your sister act in a particular way, that's the spirit of pride. It's a spirit that we are up against and not them. The chief of this spirit is called Leviathan. This is what Job 42, 34 says about it. He beholdeth all I things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Speaking about the Leviathan. Job 41, 15 to 17 from the Messenger Bible says it this way. His pride is invincible. Nothing can make a dent in that pride. Nothing can get through that proud skin. Impervious to weapons and weather. Lord God, so weapons can't get through, weather can't get through. The thickest and roughest of hides, it is impenetrable. This is the king of pride. See, so when he comes in, Lord God, you wonder why you keep talking to your brother and your sister and it seems like it's not making leeway. It's the spirit of pride. Pray against that spirit. You wonder why you're not getting through and no change is happening. And they seem like they're so thick and tough and nothing moves them. It's a lie. Something moves them, but there is a barrier. That's, allowing, that's not allowing you to get through. And understand that the only one that can kill it and deliver from it is God. That is why we have to pray and fast for each other. For ourselves and for each other. Today, my brothers and my sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ is making an appeal to the body of Christ. That it is time for us to return in humility. The humblest position that you can get in is to be prostrated on your face before God. So his people who he shed his blood for is who he is calling to come back prostrate. Repent. Have a godly sorrow that causes you to turn. For the Leviathan is the devil, the dragon. He first possessed a creature to rip the flesh of man and illegally operate against God's creation to defile and desecrate. If you read the scriptures, it was a literal animal. But you know what he's doing today? Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, and man's constant desire to act like their own gods. He is at work through mankind. He is plundering and creating terror even within the body of Christ. So today, the spirit of the Lord is saying, the blood is available. The name of Jesus Christ is available. It carries the power to break the impenetrable skin of the Leviathan the king of pride and free us from sin, hell and a reprobate mind. Our God is lowly. 
He is humble. He is meek and gentle. Even though he is vast, sovereign, majestic, and all-powerful, he chooses to be lowly, humble, meek, and gentle in dealing with us. Sorry to break in. Can you close Newell's video, please? Today, I'm calling you to heed Jesus' call. Whether you are saved, unsaved, or backslidden, the petition from the Lord is the same. The Lord is saying, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you're not seeing it, just look around. The visible things testify to the invisible. He's saying today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. When your fathers tried him and proved him. Some of you may be asking, what must you do to be saved? The answer is, repent, confess your sins, make a decision to turn from them and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, which is the removal of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. My brothers and my sisters, we can't do it our way. We already see that the spirit of pride is a controlling spirit. It's a possessive spirit. It's an obsessive spirit. So it has to be God's way in order to be delivered. Because God is the only one that can reel in the scales and destroy this Leviathan. The word says the proud he will not hear, but the humble he surely will. Remember, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. He will give you true worth and a name, as it is in him that all the family of heaven and earth is named. There is no name higher than the name of Jesus, not in heaven or on earth. And so I say the Lord bless you as you choose him today. And I want to leave this song with you because I heard it in my spirit as I was done last night and I played it the entire morning. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come on, come on, you are weary, come on. Oh, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercy is for you and for me. Come on, come on. You who are weary, come on. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, oh sinner, come on. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. 
Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Yes. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, no oh sinner, come home. Glory be to the mighty name of Jesus. I myself repented this morning when the Lord was done dealing with me. And I am still repenting. And so I'm making a beseechment to all of us to let us unmute and go into a time of repentance. As a spirit of pride, it comes in subtly, but it, it, it is outrageous. It is excessive and it drives you from God's presence. And surely we don't want to be separated from a God who died so that we could be reconciled. Let us go into repentance. Hallelujah. As we come, Lord Jesus, in your presence, oh God, we are not alone. We belong to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray that you are empty. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you will wash me and cleanse me. Make me Lord Jesus, so Right now in the mighty name of Jesus, 